thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. First, let me thank the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry, its worship team, for this gracious invitation to be with you in this opening service. God is doing some marvelous things. Amen. Won't you pray with me? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You are the potter and we are the clay. Mold us and make us after your will. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> See. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. With God, in Jesus Christ, all things are constantly being made new. God is still stirring the waters as we prepare to enter this new quadrennium. We are constantly being challenged as people of faith to see things from the perspective of a Savior who makes all things possible. Who would have thought that the Southeast jurisdiction would elect its first Korean bishop this year, and and who would have thought that at this past general conference, over 40% of the delegates would come from outside the U.S., reminding us that we are no longer becoming a global church. We are a global church, thanks be to God. And so, we gather together this week to build upon our rich history as United Methodists in seeking to cultivate a new generation of leaders for our global church. And part of our focus on leadership development this week has to be on meeting the adaptive challenges of today while preparing ourselves for adaptive challenges of tomorrow. The vision of a prophet Isaiah, cast by God and shared in scripture, see, I am doing a new thing, indeed puts within our reach today possibilities and opportunities that would otherwise be unthinkable. And so we gather as United Methodists and representative members of annual conferences. We do so mindful that we are charged and commissioned by our connection to be involved in a great work we do so mindful that we represent the diversity and the richness of our collective heritage as United Methodists. And so we do so most importantly because we are called and challenged by a creator who makes 
all things new. And then ask the question, do you not perceive it? It would indeed be a tragic mistake if as leaders of the church and those who have been charged with identifying and equipping a new generation of leaders, we somehow fail to first identify the multiple ways in which God is already doing a new thing among us. The world our clergy now live in is becoming smaller and even more decentralized due to the new realities of sharing high volumes of information through new technologies. In less than a decade, we have seen the advent of Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Just to name a few of the technologies that have changed the whole pattern of our social lives. As a matter of fact, in the span of three years, the period from 2004 to 2006, we saw the introduction of Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter in each consecutive year. And we have seen the power of these new technologies to help spawn revolutions around the world and to change for better or for worse how information is used both to help and also to harm. And so there is no doubt that we live in the midst of change everywhere around us today. According to some research done by Dr. Hero Park, staff of the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry, in her research states, and I quote, the world is becoming more organic, fluent, less hierarchical, less bureaucratic, and traditional lines of authority are blurring. And so the business world calls new leaders in this new generation matrix leaders. These matrix leaders need to deal with increasingly diverse teams, allow more autonomy, must become visionaries, and harness new technologies. The clergy, the clergy that we seek to cultivate for leadership in the world of today and tomorrow are not immune from the demands of this new style of leadership. In this ever-changing 21st century, our clergy must also be prepared to step into this matrix mold of the adaptive, multifaceted, and visionary leaders who can move with dexterity in and out of different ministry spaces. And while the trends of today and even of tomorrow demands that the church cultivate and nurture this type of leader, we must also be on guard lest our efforts to remain relevant in a changing world cause us to become more and more like the world that we seek to change in the name of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, admonition to us from Romans 12th chapter, the second verse, and one of my favorite short passages of Scripture says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So how? How do we find the right balance of being relevant without being complicit? being adaptive without being homogenized, 
in our efforts to form and nurture leaders who have vision, spiritual, and theological grounding, and the intellectual, practical skills to lead our United Methodist Church in faithful ministry in the 21st century. I believe, my friends, that the clues lies in the distinctive features of our Methodist traditions, which at their very best continue to marry personal piety with social holiness. At our best, we are both spiritual and spirit-filled, or endowed with all of the features of the Holy Spirit. And at the very same time, socially engaged with the world around us, at our very best, we as Methodists strongly affirm the biblical precepts that faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. If this, my friends, is true, then our models of leadership, cultivation, and development must reflect this. According to Bishop Joseph Pennell, now retired, the lack of leadership in the United Methodist Church is the top issue facing our denomination in the 21st century. He goes on to say, and I quote, every congregation deserves spiritual leaders who are concerned about more than institutional maintenance. We need leaders today who are concerned more about faith than maintaining the status quo. We need leaders today who are nailed to the historic faith which brought the United Methodist Church into its very being. And Dr. Albert Mosley, the president of Gammon Theological Seminary, has written, and I quote, today's clergy person must be able to speak prophetically and intelligently about health care reform, the volatile economy, prospects for world peace, and how these issues affect persons in our pews. Prophets are always contemporary, addressing the needs and concerns of the current culture with a gospel whose core message is the same throughout eternity. And so, we are looking, looking for clergy leaders today who can marry the historic faith upon which our denomination was founded with an ability to speak prophetically about the issues of today and tomorrow using mediums which are contemporary and relevant. And even this, though this may sound like a tall order, and it is, it is no less than the standard by which I believe God calls us into the kind of leadership and service that can change the world on behalf of the one who makes all things new. When I think about the characteristics of churches that have a healthy reputation for preparing, calling, and sending persons into ministry, I think of the churches like my home church, Cumberland United Methodist Church in Florence, South Carolina, which has sent over 23 ordained persons into ministry. My home church, Cumberland United Methodist Church, 
has been effective at nurturing, calling, and sending persons into ministry because like many other churches that have a healthy tradition of sending forth people into ordained ministry, it had learned how to become the kind of congregation that readily merit the historic faith of our spiritual ancestors with a prophetic and social witness using whatever mediums were at their disposal. Cumberland has sent over 23 women and men into ministry because it made the courageous choice to live out the historic faith of our spiritual ancestors. My home church, my friends, somehow learned how to live out the highest ideals of our Methodist her heritage by marrying personal piety with social holiness, faith with works, spiritual power with prophetic witness. And to achieve these ideals in a manner that was socially and culturally relevant for that day. Once, in the safe comfort of my home church, I had only to look around me to find persons, both laity and clergy, who every day in the community lived out their faith. I came of age in the turbulent 60s, and my church fully engaged, like Dr. Albert Mosley has pointed out, in the kind of prophetic witness that was socially and culturally relevant to the times we were living in. Our folk in Cumberland were not spectators in history. Rather, they were both laity and clergy, active participants. Our pastors preached messages that addressed the needs and concerns of the current culture, using the timeless language of the Gospels. If the community needed a place where persons could be organized and equipped to confront the evils of segregation and racism, they found in Cumberland open arms and well-equipped foot soldiers who were willing to engage the battles for a just society in the name of Jesus Christ. If the community needed role models and mentors for its youth, they found in Cumberland persons who fit that description in the name of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I don't know today where I would be if it was not for that local congregation, if it were not for such a local church to have been a part of my nurturing life. The members of my home church were like extended family for me growing up in segregated Florence, South Carolina. They were the ones who, more than any other group in this segregated environment, embraced me and helped me to begin to think of myself as part of the family of God. The leaders of my home church, they were the ones who were instrumental in all phases of my spiritual, emotional, and intellectual development. So part of our challenge today, and part of your challenge as members of boards of ordained ministry, as leaders of the various annual conferences, is to help our churches become the breeding ground for a new generation of clergy leaders 
who have been grounded to live out the highest ideal of our Wesleyan heritage. And part of our challenge is to nurture and equip our clergy candidates to become visionary leaders who are relevant without being complicit and adaptive without being conforming. Our local churches deserve the very best leaders that we can produce. And I am pleased that our General Board of Higher Education and Ministry has taken the initiative on behalf of our Connectional Church to respond to God's call to raise new generations of clergy by initiating the Young Clergy Project for this quadrennium. General Secretary Kim Cape has made a commitment to put our treasures where our heart is by allocating $7 million for this new initiative. The project, the prophet Isaiah again says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it shall spring up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Truly, we do live in changing and turbulent times. But even as our world becomes smaller, our need for God has never been larger. And in this increasing diverse global context, God continues to call us to raise and prepare new generations of clergy who are well equipped for the journey. And while at times this may seem like a daunting and most difficult task, given the ever-evolving demands of this changing time, we serve a Christ who makes all things new and who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And my friends, and my friends, in the end, it will be Christ. It will be Christ and not us who will make possible new leadership for a new global church. And so with the assurance that Christ has been, is, and will always be with us for as long as we are faithfully preparing leaders for God's service, we can make a difference we can make a difference in producing faithful leaders who are ready with God's help to meet the needs of our present day. And so, members of boards of ordained ministry, leaders of the various annual conferences, as you continue to do your work, remember that you do it not alone, but you do it because God is with you. And then we can proceed in our business, believing that the one who makes all things possible is also the one who has called us to this all-important venture. And if God be for us, who or what can ever stand against us? Amen. And thanks be to God who continues to make all things new. Amen. Amen.